There it is. Okay. Clemence, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kelly and I'm co-hosting with Ivana. We're so excited Hi. that you're here with us. Thanks so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for all your support uh, for the book. It's been really, really heartwarming. Thanks everyone also for being here. Yes, it's been so fun to have had the opportunity to read this book before it came out. And then knowing like what an amazing story is about to come into the world. And I felt that and I can't imagine what you've been feeling, but um, congratulations on an amazing release. You have an instant bestseller. You have the GMA buzz pick, like all of the accolades coming your way and it's so worthy of it. So congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, it's been, it's been really fun. It's been kind of a whirlwind. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Well, Ivana and I will just kick the conversation off with um, a few questions and then We'll have people just chiming in in the chat, um, wanting to to ask you some things as we go along, if that's okay. Perfect, um, yeah. We've all read the book and loved it, and we just had an awesome discussion. There's just so many things that this book brings up. Um, we could have chatted forever about it, but um, so we've all read it, so spoilers are welcome and encouraged, so don't feel like you need Excellent. to, like, you know, <laughs> hold back on anything. <laughs> um, we've all read it, just can't wait to, to hear from you, so um one of the things that I'm most curious about is how this story came to be, because you're a journalist, and I'd love to hear about your path to writing the book, and um, it's not your first language, and how that came to be, and your career choice um, leading up to this, so all the things. <laughs> yes, yes, so um, I started working on this novel in April of 2020, so I think we can all remember what a uh, special, uh, weird, uh, heightened, anxious time that was. Um, and basically, I was uh, staying in a house in upstate New York uh, with my husband and his parents. Uh, my in-laws find it hilarious in retrospect that I started writing this book, which is when I was spending a lot of time with them. <laughs> um, and... Um, it was interesting because we all knew what everyone in our little group did for a living, right? But suddenly we were all together all the time because everyone was home. And we really got to see how we all spent our time like hour by hour on a very, very granular level. And I started thinking, what if someone had a really dark secret that they had been able to keep from their family only thanks to that distance that is baked into our schedules and into our routines, right? Because we commute and we go to work during the day and then we gather again at night. And obviously you all know there's no like pandemic element in the book that was removed, but just this idea of, you know, what if someone has a setup that has enabled them to sustain this kind of secret and then suddenly it falls apart. And I played with a few scenarios in my head and that's how it became the story of Aiden and his captive. And then he has to move to a smaller, to a house that is much smaller than his original property. And so there's no shed and he has to decide what to do. And he decides or get, gets manipulated into uh, bringing his captive victim with him. And she has to live with himself and his daughter. And I knew from the get-go, I was very attracted as a writer to the idea that he might underestimate um, the effect of the bond between uh, his daughter and that woman that he holds captive. Um, that felt like something that could easily slip out of his control. And that was interesting to me. And you mentioned, you know, my, my job, I'm a journalist at my day job and I've covered true crime. So I came to this novel with, I was lucky with a sort of a big library of knowledge that I had built both through my job and through my own years of watching documentaries and listening to podcasts and reading articles and books about all that stuff. And so I think if you're a follower of true crime, you can sort of see the mark of some of the cases that sort of trickled down into this this novel. When I logged on, I heard uh, um, Elizabeth Smart being mentioned, and and I, that was spot on. Actually, that moment in the book when May is in the presence of both her captor and a stranger, and wrestles with what to do in that situation, which is very unexpected for her. Um, came uh, from me reading about um, Elizabeth Smart, who had been taken in public uh, by her captor and 
was understandably um, too scared, too paralyzed to 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 do something. I think a lot of people think, well, I would escape right away, but it has always seemed to me like I I wouldn't, I would be terrified. Because if you try something and you fail, you die. So that's a long way of saying um, that's how that story uh, started for me. Wow, that's so interesting um, to hear how all of those true crime cases kind of wove their way into this. Was there additional research that you needed to do during your writing process for this, or was it kind of just um, things that you had gathered over time on your own? It was mainly things that I had gathered over time. Um, I always try to separate as much as possible my sort of journalism brain and my novelist brain, uh, certainly in terms of any stories that I've spoken to people uh, about for work, um, I certainly always try to leave those aside, right? Because I don't want people to have to worry that they're going to tell me something about themselves or their lives, and then it's going to come up in a book later on. That's not what we want. Um, so it was, uh, for me, it was a case of sort of infusing the novel with cases I, re I had read about for years prior. And then when there was a specific aspect, uh, maybe a technical aspect or a specific bit that I wanted input on, I would read up again, sort of refresh my memory. Um, so for example, I remember trying to think about the logistics of, uh, of, of escaping. Uh, there were a few cases that I just reread because sometimes you think you remember the, the big lines of, of how something happened, but uh, as a journalist, I'm always obsessed with sort of double checking and triple checking. So there was uh, uh, some of the cases that I read about again, where uh, there was this girl called Natasha Kampusch in, in Europe, in Vienna. Uh, oh, maybe it was not in Vienna, uh, in Austria. Uh, she was abducted uh, as a child by a man and she was held captive for years. And then one day um, he had her clean his car and she was using a vacuum cleaner and he stepped away to make a phone call and for her that was when planets aligned and she left the vacuum cleaner on so that he wouldn't hear anything and she ran and uh and that's the day that she escaped from years of captivity and I remember when I reread about her case I had I, I didn't realize at the time that I think she had to knock on a couple of people's doors before someone actually sort of took her in and called the cops. I think it can be very startling for people. They can get scared, you know, when someone shows up suddenly and, and is very understandably very frazzled, but also they don't know what's going on. And uh, so I, I read a little bit about her case. In the in the US, there was the, the, the abduction of JC Lee. I do not know how to pronounce names in English. I'm sorry, Duggard, Duggard, I don't know. <laughs> Um, but she was uh, kidnapped as a as a child, and she was uh, held captive for eighteen years. Um, so I reread articles about her and and uh, you know bits of her, very small bits of her memoir, just to not to borrow any particular detail, but just to try to understand what her mindset was. Um, and then when I was working on the character of Aiden. Um, I wanted him to feel fictional. I didn't want him to feel like the fictional avatar of a specific serial killer. So I did want him to feel like he was made up, but I wanted him to feel sort of rooted in reality. And so I started doing something that um, I thought of as sort of building him from parts. And so I borrowed a few elements from real serial killers I'd read about. So he, we know he dropped out on his way to being a medical uh, student. And so that was borrowed from Ted Bundy, who was a law school dropout, mm. like me, actually. Uh, <laughs> and, um, uh, or there were a few serial killers I'd read about who had backgrounds in the military. And so that's how Aiden became um, a former Marine. That was the case for Jeffrey Dahmer. He was in the army. Uh, the Golden State Killer was a veteran. Um, you know, there were a few, a couple of cases. There's a, a serial killer who was arrested in 2012 called Israel Keys, who was very much sort of the, the modern, like the first, you know, archetype in the modern age of uh, the double life, the the partner and the ch and he had a child, but also he turned out to have had this secret life of crimes. 
uh, for years uh, and he had murdered multiple people. Uh, so all of these cases, I sort of dipped my toes in them occasionally to, to so that they would be fresh in my mind or if there was a detail I needed to get right. Um, you know, that I would, because some of those cases are referenced directly on the page. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not named, but um, in the chapter when uh, May thinks, I think it's the chapter when May thinks Aiden's about to kill her, if I remember correctly, there's a few true crime references here and there. So for anything that was actually a reference to something real, I, I you know, I made sure I, I got the details right. Interesting. One of the things that we... <clears throat> Um, had a, an interesting discussion about in our book club was the points of view that you decided to write from and whose you did not. Um, and I'd love to hear more about your decision on which points of views that you wanted to include and why, and then who you had set aside. And I'm, I'm wondering too, were there any points of view that you had originally started with that you added it out or made any changes with? Yes, I, I love this question. That was a big process for me. Um, so actually the novel started in my mind with just one point of view and it was also gonna be one point of view first person present. So it was gonna be very straightforward. Obviously the final product is not so straightforward. Um, but um, I started with, with May's point of view. Um, it's delightful by the way, to be able to call her May, like every other interview, uh, every other, event I've done it's Rachel 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 understandably but I I was it feels very healing to be able Aww. to call her by her real name yeah. um so it started out with with May's point of view only um but then and if you've read the book you, you you'll know right her point of view is very important and in my mind she is the main character but it's limited she only sees one side of Aiden, which is the side that he wants to show her. Um, and it plays to his advantage too, because he gets to make himself look very powerful and 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 like he has this because he actually has power of life and death over her. And one evening I was walking my dog, listening to a party tune from the 1990s not at all a thriller type of vibe and I, I got an idea and, and 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 I so rarely get ideas like that like usually I just have to tease at things and massage things and let you know the stories come into shape organically but that evening I when I get an idea like a fully formed idea I listen uh and I I just like what what if you know there was this other female character and she doesn't know Aiden's a serial killer and she has this massive crush on him and well now he's kind of single uh so she could try to you know get closer to him no idea what she's walking into that could be interesting and what if we did alternating perspe perspectives from that and uh then I figured well if if she's gonna be in there then I would want to hear from the daughter um as well because she would have another perspective that we wouldn't get from the other characters and she was the only character who can provide any information for us about um not just Aiden as a father but also just the history of the family uh anything we know about how he you know about how he was with his wife uh, when she was still alive what his dynamic was with his wife we only find out through Cecilia and so that was how the main chorus came to be and you did ask you know the, the the points that you had chose not to include and I knew from the onset I didn't want Aiden to speak um there are a couple reasons uh there's one silly reason and one serious one the silly one is if you've listened to interview tapes of serial killers maybe on the FBI's YouTube channel where I've spent a little bit of time uh <laughs> um Serial killers are not very interesting to listen to. Um, those tapes, you expect them to be like so tense and so full of revelations and so arresting. And very, very often they're very convoluted. The discussions kind of go in circles. The killers don't want to talk. They are obfuscating. They're lying. They have weird like bits of shame. That means they also lie to themselves. They don't want to talk about the things you want them to talk about. So I wasn't sure that a serial killer would be the best narrator to talk about themselves. 
Um, but the more serious reason is that as a consumer of true crime, I was noticing that more and more podcasts and documentaries were um, trying to refocus our attention from being solely on the perpetrators and trying to look at the victims and the people around those perpetrators who also, uh, who are victims of their lives, of their duplicity, who, you know, whose lives are suddenly shattered when they realize, you know, when they realize they've been living in a very different story than they thought. Um, and so telling that story through the eyes of those people, the victim, the love interest and the daughter, to me felt more true and more holistic in a way. Uh, to me, there was a more real world perspective. And it's interesting because it's very, it's very obviously a female led thriller, but they're all linked by this man who doesn't get to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was so interesting the way that you set that up and how intentional you were about giving voice to the victims. And it just felt really thoughtful. Um, and yeah, one of the things too we were chatting about was did Aiden's wife like have any inclination that he had this other life? And if not, like his, her parents did not like him. And we couldn't remember if there was like an incident that had happened that like set them at odds or if his parents like maybe had some sort of inclination that their son-in-law was not all that he appeared to be so I'm curious like when you discussed that who thought that the wife knew something and who thought she didn't like what was the or what was the majority let's say I, I think for sure, oh go sure, ahead sorry I thought for sure she knew and she was just pretending to not know like in the movies <laughs> But then somebody I, I brought up the mother though, if you're dying, like that's the chance to try to save your daughter. Right. So in my mind, she didn't know, but I think her parents had some inkling to not like him. And that's why he, they took the house away because why else wouldn't they support their granddaughter's future? Right. Like up to up, like her mother's just passed away yet. They're going to take her out of every familiar setting that she's ever known. So how cruel is that? Um, and so what's their reasoning for it other than they don't like him because it, there was no inclination that they didn't like her. So I just feel like as a mom and you're dying, right? You know, this is it. Why wouldn't you try to do something instead of pushing her into the father's arms saying he's your best ally? Well, maybe she didn't know, right? Well, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's so interesting. I feel like I... As the reader, I never want to like invalidate, you know, like I put the words on the page and then it's very much like there's no wrong or right answer, um, you know, to, to this question. Like every read is absolutely valid. Um, I think in my mind, the thing with the in-laws came from like when you read about serial killers, you always feel like there's always someone who had like a feeling, you know, those who especially those serial killers who managed to be like socially very uh manipulative um there's always someone like there's always someone on whom it doesn't work um or who thought you know that person was a total creep or um that kind of stuff so to me with the in-laws there wasn't one uh big incident it was more like they didn't like him because they had a weird feeling about him mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, with the mom, I mean, personally, but again, just because I think this doesn't mean it's wrong to think the opposite. To me, the mom doesn't know. However, I didn't write it in a way that makes it clear, right? Like I did leave the possibility for doubt. And I think, because I think it's complex. I think sometimes when you look at those real cases as, um, okay, well, you didn't know, I believe you didn't know, but how many questions did you not ask? How much did you need to believe that he was that good, that you sort of, and I under, I'm not saying this from a place of judgment, um, 
I, but, but I do it all the time. There are people in my life that I need to idealize a little bit and I'm aware that I'm doing it and it's very human and it's normal. Um, but so I think, I think those levels of consciousness can be uh, layered and a little complex, but um, in my, uh, yeah, that's, um, so, you know, that's why the, the pages do leave room for that kind of interpretation. Yeah. All right, Laura Beth has a question that she's gonna. Just to follow up real quick before I get to my question, I was watching the Silo Apple Plus TV series and part of the topic there is there are curious people and there are other people who are not as curious, right? So if you have a person that all they, you know, their curiosity is pumping, they're going to ask those right questions, right? And other people just aren't. They're okay with just not knowing stuff. So that was my, I think because I was watching and I'd read that Hugh Howie book, but okay. My question is, um, and this goes off of what we were talking about before, but why was it so important? And I'll say Rachel, because she was Rachel in that moment to know all those true crime stories, right? Like she came with an arsenal of knowledge that most people do not study. So she's got, you know, skills like picking locks and knowing how to escape and knowing how to communicate. And why was that an important trait for you to give her? That's such a good question. I mean, part of it was like, I needed her to have some amount of knowledge, right? Like it's, it was, uh, with like the lock picking and stuff. Um, but the the other part really is, I think I was more projecting uh, my own experiences. Like sometimes I make my way through life and, and I realized that by consuming true crime, I picked up all these little bits of knowledge that um, are usually not very useful. And then suddenly a situation comes up and I'm like, hey, I knew this because I heard it on this podcast. So like um, as part of my job as a reporter, for example, one time I had to report on something on someone who had uh, committed a misdemeanor in a national park. And my brain immediately went, oh, that means it's a federal crime. There's federal jurisdiction if it's in a national park. And I knew that because of this podcast I listened to. Um, and I think I was like, well, you know, if I ended up in danger, if I ended up, you know, confronted with somebody uh, who um, who exhibited those kinds of sort of really cruel criminal behaviors, I, I have to think that absurdly but th th those podcasts would come to mind in the same way you know and I have to think like you would rely on that knowledge to try to orient yourself she's also because she's been captive for five years she really has had time to mine the recesses of her mind for anything that is useful right and so it's this funny it's this weird idea that she would have some sort of a reference frame for her captor and it was it made her to me it made her really interesting because it gave her a chance to sometimes not really out not always outsmart him but um to analyze him a little bit and to understand sometimes what makes him tick and what he needs from her and so you know she, 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 and to act in confidence does that make sense yeah, I mean, I think it did. It it gave her more interesting inner dialogue that we got to listen to, and it got her closer to an even playing field with him, which she needed all the help she could get because he was pretty savvy. So, and I exactly. did that you're putting a little bit of you into the character as well. So I'll be interested to see if there's any more of, of you in that. So but thanks. Yeah. For she was able to manipulate him back a little bit. Right. And it was interesting for me, right, to be able to sort of make that a little bit of a a, a, a two-sided dynamic right like, like cat and mouse yeah yeah because I think fiction is more interesting when it's about um the choices the character has to make mm -hmm. um and, and the challenge in, in writing a character who is in such a dire situation as 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 May is um that she has few choices left to make because so much of her existence is dictated by her character mm -hmm. um but that was the pocket in her mind that he couldn't access. That was hers only. Someone wrote in the chat, Laura wrote, one small detail I appreciated was Aiden was the cook in the house. If someone had taken the leftovers from a meal I had made, I would have definitely noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. 
<laughs> for noticing. I would totally notice. Like I noticed that the string cheese is gone. And and that was the thing. I was like, I have to make this believable. How does he feed her this whole time? And looking back on it, there could have been other ways that he could have done it, right? He could have um I don't know, have a separate fridge somewhere or something like that. But just the idea that he would be the cook in the house and cook in bulk and then funnel out parts of his dishes made sense. And I like the idea also that he would try to be in charge and in control in as many areas of his life as he could. Uh, and that would include the running of the house. One of the things that struck me as um, <clears throat> like such a unique stylistic choice was the decision, like you had talked about to use the second person for May. And we had different ideas in our book club discussion about how that resonated with people. And like you were saying, all of it is valid, um, but it was interesting to hear how different people perceived that. And I'd be curious to hear um, about your intent behind that too. And if you wanna hear our perspectives, that's fine too, but we're, we're really curious what your intent was. Yeah, sure. Okay, I'll, I, I wanna hear the perspectives. And I will I will talk about it a little bit first, but I really want to know because I know it's like it's a choice, like it's like a capital C choice, which I don't think I fully realized when I was doing it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, people have strong reactions to this. <laughs> um, so I started writing May's perspective in the first person. So like the first sentence of the novel is, "You like to think every woman has one, and he just happens to be yours." Um, that used to be, I like to think every woman has one and he just happens to be mine. Um, but there were a few issues with writing her in the first person. Um, it, the voice didn't sing for me in the first person. And I think it's because the things that happened to her are so serious and so dire and so bad that it felt a little almost just too much in the first person. It felt a little too dramatic. And I was reading the, the nonfiction book, Three Women by Lisa Tadeo uh, when I was working on The Quiet Tenant. And in Three Women, Lisa uses the second person occasionally in some of those chapters. And as a reader, I loved it. I couldn't tell why, like I couldn't formulate it to myself, but I thought, whoa, those passages, they really sing. And I wondered, oh, I wonder if that would work for, for, for May. And I, I tried it. I had like a separate file. I was like, second voice, like work or whatever, second person. Um, and I never looked back. Like as soon as I switched her to the second person, I knew I had her voice. It just clicked. And for a long time, I didn't know why it clicked. Uh, until I read an article in, uh, I think it was electriclit.com, and it was the writer Brendan Taylor. And he had written about the use of second person in literature. And he said it can be a way to model the fragmentation of the traumatized mind. And I, like the clouds parted, the seas split open. Uh, and I was like, oh, that's why, that's why the second person works, right? Like it was my little epiphany. That's what I was doing. So to me, it modeled her trauma. It modeled her, um, the fragmentation of her mind and how removed she has to be from her essential self to get through the day. But please tell me, what was the discussion like about the second person? Marnay, do you want to share your thoughts? Because I think you were the one to kick it off. I don't remember. No, that's that's what I thought because it reminded me of a chapter in The Candy House, um, mm -hmm. Jennifer Egan, I think, where uh, Sasha's the spy and she, you know, goes through a lot of trauma. She does a lot of terrible things, and the whole chapter is told in second person because she's she's disassociating. She's distancing herself from the actual events, and so that's why it. That's what I thought it was, uh, and that's what really made it work for me. I thought that was just a, a brilliant decision. I liked it. Thank you. I'll say too, I, 
always have to somehow bring in the fact that I'm an English teacher and I teach middle schoolers. And so anytime we write a narrative, the first thing we do is pick point of view. And that's the least picked. And the kids who want to pick that point of view, the second person, it's so risky just because can you stick with it? And then like, can you make it personal? I don't know how you did it, but you made it so personal in a second person point of view, which I thought made this book so much fascinating and just different. Not many books are written like that. So for me, it definitely worked. I, th I think for the majority of us, it didn't, but I'm sorry, it did. But there was, um, maybe we had like one that wasn't a huge fan. I can't see everybody on my phone, so I can't toggle through. But if you're still here, feel free to share. <laughs> I can't remember. That was me. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I, I actually said I didn't because I'm mm -hmm. also a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> I am a reading teacher. Um, and that is one of the least used points of views. We don't really write from that second person. So it was a little hard for me to get into in the beginning. And I said, after I read it, I felt like I understood why. I felt like, you know, I got more of the point of it. But while I was reading, I didn't get it. But I got it after. Right. So I no, I mean, it's certainly an adjustment. Um, I, 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 and thank you for being teachers also, <laughs> uh, both of you uh, and any other teacher who might be listening. Um, but uh, yeah, it's certainly a choice, right? Like, and I wonder partly if maybe I'm not a native speaker. And so maybe when I started reading books and everything felt new. And so in a way, the use of the second person maybe didn't jar as much because everything was jarring. <laughs> um, and so maybe I wonder if I noticed it less because of that. Um, but yeah, it was actually, it was interesting. I, so yeah, I, I tend to start in the wrong person and then a part of the process is I, I have to switch it out and then I find my footing. But usually it helps, I, I, I start in the wrong place. <laughs> I think, Angela, do you want to share your thoughts or if you're free, I don't want to put you in the spot. Yeah, but... yeah no, for me, it um, I felt like it just made it more personal. I, I felt like it just brought me in as the reader, it, like put me in that place. Like, okay, this is you. This is what your, your life is like. This is what it's been like. This is what you do every day. Um, so to me, it was just kind of like, okay, you wanted... I took it as you wanted me as the reader to feel like I was the victim and feel like, feel what it was like to be in her shoes. Yeah. So, and and, and I, it was very yeah. effective. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've read, um, I, I've read that from readers and yeah, it's, uh, I think that it's interesting, right? Because usually the first person present is a way to make you feel like you're in the action. It's, it's considered like the most direct point of view, but I think the second person is also a hell of an efficient way of achieving that. I love it. Just, just only because I, sorry to interrupt you, we're getting like the back for the audio. I don't know if it's because yeah. maybe we all need to be muted. But we, I don't know why it's doing that. I don't know if I can hear it. Yeah, I'm getting a little bit of echo as well. Yes. I don't know if maybe we mute um we have to speak because maybe that alleviate we try it. I have no idea how to fix it. <laughs> Let me but see. That's a yes. Is this better? Yeah. Yeah. I did not okay. hear you like echo. Yeah, okay. that, that sounds better. Yeah, yeah. That's much better. What did you do? I think I just made sure everyone was muted because I don't think it was like anyone's background noise. I think it was just the echo, which okay. we've never had before. So sorry about that. I think we're good. We're good. But thank you for the explanation for that. That was something. And Melody in the chat said it was nice to have a break from that second person voice as a reader. She said it allevi alleviated um, some of that stress of the moment as a reader, which is so true. Yeah. Honestly, as a writer too. And it goes, by the way, saying like, for just the ultra getting out of May's perspective also for me as a writer and was like a huge relief and I was like oh it's probably good then that I'm doing this for the readers because 
And I had a friend who read it and she told me something that I, I always remember. She, she said, you know, May's perspective, it's very, very gripping, very dark. And then when you switch to Emily and that first chapter from Emily's perspective, she was like, it's like all the lights came on suddenly. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And it was nice to, um, the Emily chapters were kind of fun to write for me because, because Emily doesn't know that the man she's crazy about as a serial killer writing her chapters was almost like writing a romance at times right like it was just she's having a good time for like the first third of the book and uh, <laughs> and it was very good it was it, it, it was a relief for me to get to write also scenes where people were having funny little dialogue and or well funny like just lighthearted dialogue on the surface and going to bars and working and having friends it was I thought it was important so not only the second person it was nice to get a break from it because I don't think I would write a like 90,000 word novel all in the second person um but also just that change in perspective for me was whew, was a good a uh, good change of pace it yeah. takes a lot of thought and I thought about bringing your book into the classroom just to sort of introduce how you can do that but then I, I think they'd want to read yeah. the book, you know? <laughs> Novels. I don't. Know. They're only sixth graders. <laughs> <laughs> that maybe that maybe that's a bit young. <laughs> <laughs> Laura Beth, go ahead, and then we'll we'll pop over to Wendy after that. Um, not so much a question, but just want to follow up on that. What I liked about the different perspectives is it was direct um, opposite. So you have one captive that is disassociated. She's basically talking to herself, telling herself what to do. And then you have, so May's totally, you know, pinned down by this, which we feel as well. And then you have Emily that is free, that is almost the next May or the next victim. And so it, it leaves that freedom of dialogue, but there's this overshadowing of how many times did she almost get it, get, you know, Aiden almost get her. So I loved the distinct points of view from them and it, they were a great dichotomy yeah so kudos to that I appreciated it thank you I'm glad Wendy are you free or do you want me to read it for you yeah I'm good okay. um I uh I just had a question about sort of the thought process behind um May being so insistent on taking Cecilia with her at the end, you know, towards the end of the book, you start realizing, okay, she's working through this. She's figuring out a way to escape, you know, she's going to make it. And she kind of has some opportunities that, that the fact that she wants to take Cecilia with her holds her back. And um, I just wanted to, I just want to hear your thoughts on your thought press on, on that and, and deciding how that ending was going to happen with, with the escape and everything. Yeah, that's a really good question. Actually, when I read it in the chat like a minute ago, I was like, oh, I have to like think about that. I have to remind, or I have to remember <laughs> why I did certain things. Um, I think the first thing for me in thinking of the relationship between May and Cecilia was that um, Cecilia is the first person May has seen in five years who is not her captor. Uh, so that just trying to sit with that for a little bit, um, she would get extraordinarily attached, right? You know, what I mean? like, like there's a bond there that just would be absolutely overpowering, um, regardless of, and it, and she happens to be a very pleasant kid to be around who's also, um, in need of some affection who needs a presence in her life. And so, uh, but even even if I think even if Cecilia had been a total brat, I don't think May could have at all resisted the appeal of a new person, um, a new face, a new voice, and just a new window in, on the outside world. And it's not someone who perceives her as a person who's just here to be dominated. It's someone who almost looks up to her, right? Like she, she it matters to Cecilia sort of what May does and thinks. And so I think there would be something like a weird kind of love there. And, but I think if you dig a little deeper in May's psyche, a big conflict in her mind is that she has to accept that in order to free herself, she's going to have to explode this young girl's uh, life, right? Like, and um, 
I think she has such little sense of self uh, at the beginning of the novel that um, it's hard for her to get to that point that to think that it's sort of worth it and justifiable and that she's going to be able to live with herself if she does that. Um, someone is Laura Beth, thank you for raising this point. She does also believe that Cecilia is a victim as well of her father. At least there's enough room there for her to think that um, that Cecilia is being victimized by her father. And it leads her to think, well, you know, if I try to escape very, you know, she thinks about it very logistically. If he comes home and sees that I'm gone, you know, maybe, maybe he kills her and then he kills himself or they flee together. Like either way, it's not going to be good for the kid. Um, she has only ever seen Aiden as dangerous and in control and destructive. So it, it she cannot conceive of him any differently. Um, and so I think for her, there, there become there, 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 there is this vital thing that comes up, even when she realizes that Cecilia is probably is is actually not being abused by her father, uh, probably. Um, that those noise, that's not what she was hearing. Um, I think she still needs to make sure that Cecilia is safe uh during the course of her escape but then i think when the escape does happen she does wonder are you protecting the girl or just using her as bait because at some point that's also i think what's happening but that's part of her crossing over to the side where she's ready to ready to escape <clears throat> i'm curious about your writing process i'd like to circle back a little bit to um one of my favorite questions to ask authors is if you're a pantser or a plotter, as far as um, how you go about the structure of your writing. And if you're able to comment a little bit about how you envisioned, envisioned this going in your mind and in the editing process, were there major changes that took place? Or um, you had mentioned the points of view, were there any plot points that had changed or taken, a new, taken on a new life? I love this question because I have a very, very like strong answer to it. And you know, whatever, like everyone's method works for them. Like there are people who love a detailed outline and it works for them. I can't outline it. I just, it just kills the process for me. It kills any desire I have to sit down with the story and work on it. So usually it, it varies, like it's always the same thing. I know how something begins. I know going in how it's gonna end. Um, I don't know how I'm going to get there and figuring out how I'm, I get there is half the fun. Mm -hmm. I usually know in terms of how the characters are going to change psychologically, uh, what journey they have to go on, the things they have to overcome or understand or prove to themselves. Um, but I don't, I don't know what scenes it's going to take for me to get there. I may have some ideas of things I want to try to insert, but and sometimes they turn out to be really bad ideas and they don't make it in and <laughs> and sometimes they work out um and I, I usually think of it as like if you're trying to walk in the dark and you have a flashlight that only shows you you know two feet ahead or five feet ahead and um by the time you've crossed over those five feet well your flashlight is showing you five more feet mm -hmm. and Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So as you 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 go the whole way, but you never see it, uh, you know, until you get there. Um, in terms of edits, there was there weren't any huge changes. Like the ending was never different. Uh, there is no draft where like Aiden, you know, Aiden gets the perspective, or there's no draft where May kills him. You know, <laughs> um, like there's no no huge plot point changed. Um, Cecilia's chapters were a topic of discussion in edits. Um, we wondered, like, well, should they be in there? Do they? What do they bring? Um, we we did change. We we actually developed them a little bit so that they would be more uh, tied to the plot than they were originally, right? Like a little less just cosmetic and a little bit more um, tied to the story on the page. Um, her voice was something I had to refine. I actually, while I was in edits, I was still trying to get it right because teenage girl is a difficult register to, 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 to hit 
Um, you you don't want her to sound like an adult, but you also don't want like an you don't want to sound like an adult trying to sound young, <laughs> which is just like just death, uh. immediate death on the page. <laughs> death on that. And um, and that's a gripe that I so frequently uh have when I'm watching something. If if the dialogue the young people sounds like fourth, it it really kills it for me. And when I say we, I I, I am talking about me and my editor. Yes. I'm still seeing in the chat, Brenda mm -hmm. uh, asked. It was a good question. Um, it's not the royal we. <laughs> <laughs> it's me and my editor. Um, but uh, yeah, so I was still trying to nail Cecilia's voice. And I went voice shopping a little bit. And I ended up rereading a French novel called Bonjour Tristesse. It means hello, sadness. It's the Frenchest title you could ever conceive of. <laughs> And it's a, uh, it was written decades ago, but it's about a teenager, a teenage girl who spends a doomed summer uh, at a beach town with her father and his two girlfriends. And it's not a thriller, it's a literary novel, but it's written a little bit like a thriller where you know the story is hurtling towards something bad that's going to change everything from everyone, uh, but you don't know what it is. And her voice is very, she does come off as young, but also really perceptive. And, um, but also she can't fully grasp everything that's happening around her, but somehow it's conveyed in a way that makes it clear to us, the reader. So that was, uh, that ended up being um, my inspiration and something that I, I worked on in edit. Yeah, I could see how that could take some finesse to like get it <laughs> just right. Yeah, it was, I had a lot of anxiety <laughs> about it. How long was that? Just wondering from, you know, when you first started to publication. Yeah, so I, uh, the book came out two years after I signed my contract. Um, it was, it's on the longer end. It's not exceptional, right? It's, it's always going to be between one year and two years, basically, uh, between when you sign your contract and when the book comes out. Um, and it kind of depends on when your contract happens and then what season the book needs to come out in, right? Like there's certain seasons for certain kinds of books. I'm sure you've noticed, right? Like summer is just thrillers. Um, obviously this is not a Christmas book, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so January is a lot of nonfiction, et cetera. So, so, so there were two years and I think I was, I believe I was in edits like actual content edits for six months. Um, I had an editor switcheroo during that process. So the editor who acquired the novel, whose name is Tim, left for a different publishing house. And then my new editor, Reagan, took over. And they were both fantastic. It was actually super helpful to work with both of their notes because... <laughs> Um, I think I'm a pretty deferential writer. Like uh, if if an editor brings something up, I, I will always engage with it. Uh, and usually, and sometimes, you know, it's not exactly the solution they suggest that's going to end up on the page. But usually if I, if I get given a note, there's usually something to be done, even if it's like a small thing, there's something to clarify. But it was so captivating as, a, as an emerging writer to see these two people who, 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 whose work I respect so profoundly and who have had shown themselves as such brilliant minds, sometimes disagreeing with each other. Like they didn't always have the same notes. They didn't always have the same points of view, which is normal because we all react differently to a book. And so it pushed me to having to make my own choices as a writer, which is part of the job, but it, I needed to be sort of empowered to do it. That's so interesting that you had the two different perspectives and then kind of had to claim claim your own voice in that. Yeah, yeah, it was it was very uh I was like, "Woo, that's a responsibility over here." But <laughs> <laughs> yes. Was there one perspective that you enjoyed writing the most? Ooh, actually, I promise it's not me like copping out. Um but I truly, I don't think I have a favorite. I, I mean, I do think the one that clicked the fastest for me was was May slash Rachel. Um, she's 
the heart of this book for me and uh, the novel couldn't happen without her. But because her perspective is so dark and, and because she only sees that one side of Aiden, it was actually very fun for me as a writer to hop a, you know, between the different perspectives. So I really enjoyed, when I was writing Emily, I enjoyed writing the more bentery parts of the book. And, and, the, and I love, I, I love a bartender character. Um, so I really enjoyed getting to play with that trope. Uh, I, and, and then I, I, I'm fascinated by serial killers who have families. So anything from Cecilia's perspective was really me like scratching an itch <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to make sense of things on paper that I can't make sense of in real life, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, and to answer unanswerable questions. Yeah. Well, we as readers really appreciated that mix too, but I always love hearing, yeah. you know, if you had a favorite, but um, as far as just the overall message for your book, what do you hope that readers take away from this story? I think ideally I would like people if I can, if someone reads it and is moved to have more empathy and to understand the difference between empathy and sympathy, that's what this book taught me. And so if that comes through in the pages, I think that would, I mean, that would make me very, very happy as a writer. Um, and yeah, try. I think trying to think about crime and violent crime in this kind of sort of wider perspective and trying to maybe move beyond the traditional you know idea of there's of sort of crime investigation the guy is caught and we never talk, you know we we don't need to think about those people ever again uh, the idea that life has to continue for all involved uh is something that I personally go back to a lot mm, I love that Melody, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Um, all right. So one thing I loved about this thriller was the lack of, it just wasn't overly graphic. We didn't see what happened in the scenes and the brutal murders or whatnot. So I'm curious to hear how you decided to really tame it down versus like how much graphicness you gave, because I think typically authors would have made it more uh brutal thank you uh first of all I'm glad it came off this way um I think this was something that came to me very intuitively as a writer I, I knew going into this book that I would have to write about violence and I I was I had some trepidation about that um I never wanted it to come off as exploitative um and I think this came from, honestly, my real life experiences as a journalist. I've interviewed survivors of sexual violence. Uh, and I have had to learn how to navigate those conversations. And the last thing you want is to re-traumatize somebody. And I think it really um, imprinted on me the idea that to, we can talk about, about sexual and physical violence without describing it. And without ha without without having to focus on the act themselves, um, what matters in the novel is the impact it has on someone's psyche. Um, and so that that's what I brought in the page. Um, there is no draft where those scenes are more detailed. It was like a line in the sand. I had I couldn't. I just couldn't go there. I didn't want to. And. Um, which is interesting because I think in the book there are certainly like in in scenes of intimacy that, that are consensual, the book goes there. Um, and it was important for me to include that range also. Uh, it felt true. Um, but yeah, I, I, in terms of describing physical violence, I, I, I did feel like I was asking the reader to be there mentally with the character during difficult moments. And that felt a bit of an ask. Um, but I just couldn't, I, and I, and I don't think they were needed. I don't think we needed physical, um, details of, um, of what was happening. 
which I think I actually, think- sorry. yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. I was say, I think you handled it really well because of how you wrote <clears throat> it. It makes it easy for me to recommend it to all readers. Cause like you said, it doesn't re-traumatize those that have had, you know, been in sexual assault and such. Thank you. I- I'm really glad that that really always sort of warms my heart when people react this way to it. And Actually, I think, Laura Beth, this feeds into what you wrote in the group chat uh, about writing the victim's perspective. Um, I think if a victim is going to talk about what happened to them, usually they talk about the impact on them rather than, you know, getting into all those details of what happened, which are not the most relevant for for them. And, And for me, writing the victim's perspective was, very was more was important as a writer because um i feel like it's i don't know i i i mean i'm i i've i've read a lot of serial killer stories obviously right but i think the prism of the victims is the most relevant the most important ones what are the lives that are affected what are the ones that are derailed or interrupted um or brought to an end it felt meaningful to go about it that way um because gave, yeah I was just gonna say you gave us such a blast of information from each victim that had so much personality from each female but what they brought to us was so different in every situation and the thing we talked about in book club was he gave so much information about his personal life why you know like why did yeah they- that was fascinating. So I was wondering why you chose to to do it like that. Yeah, that's such a good question. It's an interesting point to raise. I think I always feel like there's a weird form of in the last moment between a killer and a victim. It's almost like a priest and a confession. Like right. he's not someone who has friends he can talk to. Right. Like he never gets to show all of himself to one person at once. And I think it would be tempting for him to share those parts of himself, to talk about his life in that manner. But the only people he can do it with are the people he's about to kill because they're not going to be around to tell anyone else. And I think also for him, there's this is a form of vulnerability mentally, but he can access it when physically he's in such a position of power. It doesn't feel you know, intimidating. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, it's a controlled environment and that's the only place he feels safe. Right. So. Exactly. And you see the panic when he, when he almost loses that control, you know, that. Exactly. Because it would be disastrous for him. I mean, every time and you see it, there was the Israel Keys case, the serial killer case I mentioned earlier, the guy who was arrested in 2012. I think when you hear him talk about his crimes, I mean, he's dead now, but when he talked to the FBI in the non-boring parts of the interview, you do feel like those guys who get away with it for years, every time they kill somebody, there's this gamble aspect to them. It's a risk they take. Um, Maybe this is the one that's going to get them arrested. You know, they don't know. Um, So I think also he would be in a very, very heightened state that which might also explain why he talks you know so much yeah it makes me go back to mind hunter that series when they do yeah this. yeah well brenda do you want to close us out yes um i'm just curious did you love writing this so much that you want to write another book that's a thriller are you ready to venture out and do something very different Yes, um, I actually, I, I did love it so much that I wrote another thriller. Um, <laughs> I actually sent my agent a draft of a new psychological thriller the day before The Quiet Tenant came out, Ooh. like June 19th at 11 p.m. And then the next morning I broke my laptop irreparably. <laughs> it was just done. <laughs> The same laptop I wrote the quiet tenant on. It was just it was old. She it was it was time for a new one. It couldn't hold a charge. The keyboard was all over the place. It didn't have half the keys. So it was done. But mm-hmm. it was like a sign of the gods. 
Um, and what I will say is um, The Quiet Sins, obviously, is set in the winter, upstate New York, very cold, very dark. The settings are very bare. You know, there's the garden shed, the house. It's all very simple. And when I was trying to think about what to write next, I, I decided I wanted to write a novel, to go somewhere warm and beautiful. <laughs> and I set it at this beautiful uh, hotel in the desert in Utah. Um, which is based on a real hotel that I was very lucky to go to years ago, but I decided, you know, maybe I could ruin it by setting a murder story there. <laughs> so it was fun to to go there. Oh wait, this what hotel lived? was it? That's where I uh, live. <laughs> the real one, which is not the hotel in the book, right? I've changed some things, but the one that I went to that gave me the inspiration was the Amongiri in um in the desert uh, okay. near Escalante. Like yeah. Yeah, that like all the famous people go to. Yes, absurdly. I, I spent like two nights there 10 years ago and I still think about it. It was the most beautiful place I've ever seen in my entire life. But it also has like a little bit of menace because it's very isolated. It's hard to find. Middle um, of nowhere. Middle of nowhere. We actually almost gave up on finding it and went to like a motel because it was like the sun was setting and we had missed the turn 13 times. And... I was younger and I was with my family and my English wasn't so like wasn't as good as it is now and I ended up taking the phone and talking to the person at the hotel and like guiding my dad who was driving and <laughs> we finally and it's beautiful but it's like it's so isolated that like you might see a coyote from your bathroom window and if you want to get out quick you can't <laughs> so it seemed it, it was like a little uh you know and it's a desert it's not a very uh, friendly environment so it seemed to lend itself there uh to a thriller pretty pretty well that sounds amazing we're all like oh sign us up for reading that that sounds so good we can't wait thank you uh, thank you so much okay last thing before sorry la actual actual last thing before our picture do you have any book recommendations off the top of your head books that you've read recently or any favorites that you yes want to share <laughs> oh I love this question okay um let's see Catherine Ryan Howard has a book coming up called The Trap and it is incredible I I see some nods maybe people have already read it <laughs> yeah isn't it so good oh my god it's based on a real life series of disappearances in Ireland um, I thought it was completely addicting and it has one scene that is just like so terrifying it, like it's it had been a while since I had read a book that made me afraid of the dark <laughs> but but this one really did it's so good um and then Paul Tremblay has a new actually hold on I can't not do this Paul Tremblay has a new short fiction collection out <laughs> um it's called The Beast You Are he writes horror uh he's I think he's an amazing writer. Uh, so I would recommend The Beast You Are. And then also Katie Williams, My Murder. It's a speculative novel and a thriller at the same time. It's set in a not too distant future in which the female victims of the same serial killer are all cloned back to life. And so the protagonist needs to live in the aftermath of her own murder and perhaps solve it. And it is incredible it's such a good book so I, I mean I'm sure I'm gonna look at my list of books that I've read Megan Abbott Beware the Woman uh I'm gonna list I'm gonna look at the books I've read and like feel yeah. like I, I've forgotten so many uh Lucky Dog by Helen Shulman which is inspired by a real life um part of uh the Weinstein case when he hired former spies to try to dis to discourage the actress Rose McGowan from publishing a book in which she would talk about him. Uh, and the novel takes just this idea and then makes a whole other story up and it's really good. So okay. those are my wraps. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And then we saw that um, the the screen rights have been sold, correct? For Is this going to be a TV series? Is that correct? And you're the executive producer? I Yes, I'm attached to be an executive producer. So... You know, as always with those deals, right? Like there's an option and then the, uh, the, the, like it needs to actually happen, you know, the, the, so with Hollywood, usually you're not sure until you're eating the popcorn, but fingers, <laughs> I really hope it gets made because the producer, Jason Blum, 
has such a strong vision for it. Like I just, um, he sees it as a limited series and he's really sounded uh, like he completely understood it and knew how to bring it to the screen. And he totally sold it to me. Like, I want to watch this show. So <laughs> I really, really hope it happens. Aww. And I would be very excited. I am very excited about the executive producer credit. I think it's wonderful when, when writers can, can be, when the author can be involved. But obviously I also support the WGA and the SAG after strike. So mm -hmm. in due time, <laughs> once yes. there's fair deal. Well, we are so excited for you and we just can't wait to see what comes next. Um, are we able to get, Melody, are you going to snap a quick picture for us? If that's all right. If you have a book, grab it. If not, just smile. For oh me. my God, I don't have the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hold this one. <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> so that I have it works. Okay. Ready? Uh-huh. Let me do one more. Oops. Sorry, guys. Okay. Ready, set. Okay. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for having me. This was honestly a delight. I could stay here for three more hours. <laughs> uh, so, th and thank you for the generous reads uh, and the kind words. This was really, really great. Thank you for having me. Thank you for You're joining us. We are so excited that the book is out in the world and we, yeah, we just can't wait to see what comes next. So thank you again thank for you. your time. Of course. Thank you all for your time. Thank you for, thank you for your support. Yeah. Bye. Thank Prima. you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Avada, you better get back to your vacay. <laughs> <laughs> They're outside roasting s'mores, so I'm going to go pop in and see how it's going. Oh, good. <laughs> well, I'm glad and you didn't. I did go to a bookstore and Clemens say, if you're still here, I went, I'm in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, just on a trip with my family. And I visited a bookstore today and the book owner, she had not heard of your book. And I'm like, what, like, what do you mean? <laughs> I started talking to her because I said, we're doing this tonight. And she's like on her computer. She's like, I'm ordering this now. This has to be. Yes. Nice. <laughs> that was okay, super fun. Thank you. Well, thank so you for but, doing like, that. Yeah. I really appreciate excited. it. She was so excited when she like learned what it was about. So. Well, yeah. thank you for bringing it on her radar. Thank you. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank Thanks you. For Thanks again, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Thank, you. Thank you. Bye, Kelly. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Lynn, it's good to see you too. Oh, thank you. You girls <laughs> did a great job again, as always. Aww. So, so I'm so proud of both of you. Aww. <laughs> Your daughter's amazing. She really is. Oh, well, all of you are amazing. It's just fun to um, do the author chats and, and just see what everyone has, you know, in their mind of what they think think about the books and yeah it's fun it's a good it's a good escape that's yes. for sure yeah. That's a good, yeah yes well good night everybody and happy birthday birthday next time. Birthday. i hope you had a yeah, great day yeah to benjamin did you say happy birthday yeah. to benjamin yeah i know <laughs> i know that's i hope you had a good boy yep <laughs> yeah Oh, all right. Well, thanks. Enjoy the rest of your vacation with your family. Yeah, have fun. It's beautiful weather. Yeah. Oh, oh I gotta, I'm I gotta I stop recording.